getting a bunch of email from people from Talbot Springs. Has, was there is there some reason someone has been given to believe that there's any question as to whether or not we want to do this? Oh, okay. Well, you know, when we suddenly start getting, you know, don't not do this. I think. Yeah, we agreed to it like six yeah. weeks ago. Yeah, okay. Probably still open. I mean, the we're pool. still looking forward to Mr. Washington's report. <laughs> yes, yes. I just, I, you know, just for clarification. All right, Talbot Springs parents, we we, we are doing you. this. We heard you. Yeah, we're we're. We agree. We might, you know, give these guys a little bit of a hard time, but there is going to be a new school. Well, All right. We didn't vote on that yet. Didn't we? <laughs> okay. Well, maybe that must be why they. Uh, we're going to yeah. do it. Yeah, we, okay. had, we, we had to go through the process. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, that's right. All right. Well, I thought we already voted on it. So. <laughs> All right. Good evening. Uh, tonight, we present the feasibility study for Talbot Spring Elementary School. Uh, I'm Scott Washington, Director of School Construction, and with me is Ms. Robin Tolf, Principal of TCA Architects, Dan Lubley, our Manager of Design and Pre-Construction Services, and I do believe Ms. Thompson is back there in the back as well, the Principal of Talbot Spring. <laughs> oh, she's the one who's been getting all those people to write to us. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, she is very circumspect. Oh, wait a minute, I had a little difficulty here real quick. Let me see. It's summer, the electronics are testy. There we go, gotcha. All right, Tower Spring Elementary School opened up in 1973 as a single story open classroom instruction facility. It has had two additions and one minor renovation in 2000, 2008, and 2013, respectively. The current school is about 54,089 square feet with approximately 500 students. The purpose of our study is to examine the existing facility in the lens of equity in light of student population, deficient program spaces, and systemic needs. With this mandate, we looked at three options ranging from a limited renovation and addition to a full replacement of the existing school. Also, based on our recent success at Wild Lake Middle School and at the request of the county, we did take a look at a possible net zero option as well with the replacement option. And now Ms. Toth will talk about the project in a bit more detail. Thank you. Talbot's Elementary School is located on White Acre Road in Columbia at the intersection of Basket King Road. The site is approximately 10 acres. The bus loop serves eight buses and is separate from the parent drop-off and parking areas. There are 77 parking spaces currently on site. There are two separate play fields, a hardtop play area, and two um, separate playground equipment areas that are shown in brown on the plans. To help with the current enrollment, 10 temporary classrooms, including a large five classroom modular, modular unit, have been added to the site, both in the front and in the back of the existing school. The existing school is a single story building that was originally built in 1973 as an open pod classroom design. The addition, an addition was built in the back of the building in 2000 that provided a separate gymnasium and an art room. The roof was replaced in 2006. A small pre-K addition was built near the main entrance in 2008. And in 2013, a limited renovation upgraded some of the mechanical and electrical systems and provided low partitions to help divine the existing classrooms. Yet, since the partitions are not full height, sound still travels from corridor to classroom and from classroom to classroom. There are also several classrooms that are located in the interior of the building, which means they lack natural daylight and views to the outside. The administrative suite is located near the main entrance, but not close enough to have good visibility of the front of the school. And also, the main entrance does not have the secure vestibule, which is now standard in new construction. Um, even with the additions and renovations that the existing school has received, you can see here in this diagram that many of the spaces in the existing building are shown in red and pink or pink, which means they are currently undersized. All spaces shown in red are more than 20% smaller than the program size. Red spaces include the administrative suite, the health suite, which also would not meet the Comar standards, the gymnasium, the platform, and half of the classrooms. 
Areas shown in pink are between 10 and 20 percent smaller than program size, so therefore the vast majority of the classrooms are considered undersized. To address the increase in student population over the years, again, 10 temporary classrooms have had to been added around the building. Here you can see the feasibility study was completed per the state's requirements to review three schemes. Scheme one evaluates light renovations to the existing building only. Scheme two looks at major renovations to the building and additions. Scheme three proposes a new replacement school. Scheme one includes light renovations which update the existing systems, provides handicap accessibility to the entire school, and improves circulation issues but this scheme does not provide an addition, which leaves many undersized classrooms and would require the temporary classrooms to remain on site. This scheme does not improve the security issues at the main entrance, as the administrative suite would remain as is. And new work for this scheme would be phased <coughs> since the building will be occupied during construction. Scheme two, which is shown in the middle, um, proposes a major renovation with three additions. New work for this scheme would also be phased and and the building would be occupied during construction. This scheme addresses the entire school, improving the size of all spaces, provides a security vestibule, and improves the administrative suite, health suite, building circulation, um, sorry, excuse me, building systems, mechanical, electrical, and data, and replaces the entire roof. The scheme allows, allows for the reconfiguration of spaces so that the temporary classrooms would be removed. While the additions allow for space sizes to increase, the existing facility provides limitations in regard to adjacencies of programs, and the circulation routes are inefficient and winding. This scheme also limits the amount of play fields available during construction, um, as the temporary classrooms would need to be re relocated on site for the addition to be built. Um, Skeet 3, which is at the bottom, proposes constructing a new modern school and then demolishing the existing building. This scheme allows the existing school to function as is while the new school is built on a separate part of the site. While there would be some light site limitations during construction, they would be less disruptive to the existing school functions than the other two schemes. Along with the improved room sizes, circulation, adjacencies of each department, the replacement school provides Talbot Springs Elementary School with a new high performance building. This scheme allows for many more improvements to the building, uh, to the school, including but not limited to energy efficient building envelope design and building systems, which result in lower operation costs and less impact to the students during construction. We would recommend Scheme 3 and the replacement of the existing school. Lastly, at the very bottom, sorry, is um, based on the success of Wild Lake Middle School, we have looked at the net zero option um, for the replacement scheme. This was only looked at for the new building as it becomes increasingly difficult on an existing building. While net zero does reduce the operating costs of a facility over the long term, it does come with added constraints and increased upfront costs to a project. And it would be good to note that unlike Wild Lake Middle School, these added costs would be completely locally funded. Right. There are no state grant monies provided for this project to become net zero like there was for Wild Lake. Right. Here we see the proposed Scheme 3 floor plans. This scheme is based on a proven layout of the, um, which is currently being constructed at Elementary School 42. Um, this model is designed, or excuse me, the Elementary School 42 model is designed for 788 students. Right. This scheme shown here has been reduced for four, 540 students. The smaller single-story model used at Hollyfield Station and the two-story model used at Ducketts Lane both were evaluated for this site, but their footprints are not as compact as this particular um, scheme and are much longer, which present a, um, issues when you're trying to construct it while the building is being occupied and it makes it cost prohibitive. Um, since Scheme 3 is based on the latest elementary school model, all spe aspects of the ed spec are accommodated with the minimal adjustments and allow for reduced um, capacity size here. The new school will be constructed on the existing 
open play fields that are adjacent to Basket Ring Road. A separate bus loop and a separate drop-off area would be maintained. This placement also allows for the existing school and all temporary classrooms to remain in their current locations during construction. While some of the play fields will be removed from access, impact to the existing school is held to a minimum. It also be important to note that the playground that was just constructed on the site has been coordinated with this scheme and would be able to remain um, in use at the end of the project. Um, the final scheme allows for the existing eight buses and allows for an increase of parking up to 110 spaces. When evaluating the possibility of creating a net zero building, it is important to understand the de definition of a net zero building, which is a building that produces more energy, I mean, as much energy in a year's time as the amount of energy the building consumes in a year's time. <laughs> Therefore, the amount of energy produced must be equal or more to the amount of energy consumed. This means, in fact, that any building can really become net zero as long as the owner has enough room to provide the amount of solar panels um, that would be required to produce the energy needs that run that building. In order to make net zero a cost-effective solution to the owner, the designer wants to produce a highly energy efficient building that will therefore reduce the amount of solar panels that need to be purchased and maintained to power that building. Oh, we're still on this one. Is that one? <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Um, to understand the building's energy efficiency, we look at something called an energy use index, which was on the last slide, mm -hmm. and it compares the amount of energy that is used to power a square foot of the building. Um, a typical building of the age of Talbot Springs would have an EUI energy use index of about 66. A code compliant building would be around 51. A sustainable building that is certified LEED Silver, as the state requires by the U.S. Green Building Council, um, like the Thomas Wyatt Middle School, is approximately 38. Um, but for the net zero um, goal to be um, to be met with an efficient building, you really want to drastically reduce your EUI to down to around a 28. And as a side note, Wild Lake is actually functioning in the teens currently, right. so it has far exceeded the original intent. Um, when analyzing a school design and to reduce the energy usage of the building, lighting is an aspect, is one of the aspects important to evaluate. Um, this particular chart, chart shows the wattage that is used per square foot, so how much energy is being used for the square foot of lighting. Once again, we're comparing code compliant versus a lead silver sustainable design versus the net zero design at Wild Lake. And you can see um, it uses half the energy of a code compliant building. Um, this is also important because this is just one example of energy efficient design strategies that can be used in any school to reduce the energy consumption and thus reduce your operating costs for the life of that building, even if you're not net zero. So this and many other energy efficient strategies were used at Elementary School 42 in that design and would be found in Scheme 3. Um, those solar panels might not be or may not be provided at this school to create a net zero building. It is still possible to have and provide a highly energy efficient design. What we have here is basically our entire schedule for the project. Um, based on the selection made today by the board, uh, the feasibility study will next go to the state and we get their review and their comments back. We would expect to get their comments back by the end of September, 1st of October, which would then start our design process. So our design process pretty much would run from October of 2017 to about September of 2018. By the time that's taking place, you go through your whole bidding and awarding process. We would start construction about March of 2019, and if options two and three are picked, finish up around June of 2021. Another item we looked into also, and this is just potentially, we looked into the possibility of what the state would actually fund and what the local side would have to actually fund in terms of the project. Of course, um, it made more sense to take a look at scenar scenarios two and three, which is our full replacement renovation, of course, and also our replacement school, excuse me. The renovation model shows about a 6.9 million dollar percentage from the state and 16.7 locally, while the replacement school option showed about a 13.2 million dollar contribution from the state and about 13.9 million dollar option locally. Again, 
These are just our estimates based off of what we currently understand and know. We will not know completely until this has been submitted to the state and they get back their feedback. But once again, as Ms. Toth already recommended or already noted, there is no MEA grant for the project as it was with Wild Lake. So if we did decide to go with that net zero option, again, it will all be done on a local level. So with that in mind, as already been stated, our recommendation is to go with the total replacement school option. Uh, contingent on state approval. Uh, we will bring the schematic design back to you in December of 2017. Um, once again, going through the schedule I just talked about, March of 2019, we will uh, basically start construction and scheme three will be done by on um, December 2020, excuse me. How we would basically attack the project is the same way we attack Wild Lake, where pretty much we would build the existing the new school first on the other site, move the staff and students in over the winter break of December 2020, get them into the new building, and then, of course, in January, February 2021, beginning to demolish the existing building and, of course, make the necessary parking fields and things like that. That's why the total project won't be finished until June to August of 2021. So that's our recommendation. And at this time, we will answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Ms. Coombs. Thank you for your presentation. Yes, uh, it was very helpful to with the diagrams. Um, and you know what the standards are that are included in the in the larger um, to see what all the schemes and all the requirements are on square footage. Mm -hmm. um, I have two questions. Sure. Um, hopefully, this one's a quick one. I'll ask this one first. Um, when does it need to be determined whether or not we're going to try to go net zero? At what point in the process would we have to 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 say that? We really need that, honestly speaking, at the schematic level, which is the first area of design, because basically, um, as with the Wild Lake project. All those parameters had to be taken into account from the very beginning. It starts in the beginning of the design. So if we decide to go that route, when we get the feedback back from the state, we would have to make that, have that decision ourselves as well. So that's, a, that's a month away? Yes, okay. ma'am. Um, my second question is, um, the 500 um, capacity, that mm -hmm. does not include pre-K? No, that does not include pre-K. And why are we not choosing to go with a slightly larger footprint more on the 660 or the, um, what is it, Bruce 779? Well, pretty much a, a couple of things. And Ashley, Ms. Kamen, she needs to address something that she can as well. Um, number one, we took a look at the larger model, but let me also let you know, it, the class, the building itself, and I wish if I, let me go to the slide that actually shows the layout. If you look at it, it actually includes four classrooms per level, and actually four pre-K classrooms, four K classrooms, and then of course four classrooms one through five. Capacity count, Ms. Kamen, does not include pre-K, I do not believe. So even though it says 500 kids in terms, that's the capacity of the K through five, there's still pre-K room built into the model to accommodate those children. Okay. Thank you. How many pre-K kids are encountered for in those uh, is it, uh, three? Basically, you have four classrooms, and basically, if my count is basically, what is it, Renee? Is it 20 per, 20 per child? So that's about 80 children okay. with pre-K alone. Thank you. That's not a part of that 500. So why aren't we going? Why aren't we assuming that there could be a bigger capacity here and going for a 660? Well, one of the re one of the reasons also. Brandon, I understand that the, the, oh, no the neighborhood no. is mm. not a growing neighborhood. And I think that's one of the reasons because actually, when we did our projections working with school planning, we do not show the population at school going to over 500. I think until about 2020. I mean 2030 potentially at the very earliest. And then even up through almost um, 2040, it's still slightly around 550, 560, 570. So we're building a school right now that at minimum would be able to take the 540. You're not getting to that number for at least another 15, 16 years, the way our projections show right now, okay. if I'm not mistaken. You're, you're correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. Ms. French. I had the same question as Ms. Coombs. Mm -hmm. But I was thinking that the net zero decision didn't have to be made until December. Your, your timeline says October to December for mm -hmm. the schematic design. Right, but that's including, that's, and that's, that's, that's the month, the three months we're doing the SDs. We need to know as that process starts. Oh, when it so, starts. Yes, Because usually when you bring us the mm -hmm. schematic and we approve it. Mm -hmm. We would already have made that decision. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Gotcha. Um, do we have, is there anything going on legislatively or with the funding on the capital budget level in the state? Um, I thought there might be some 
movement toward uh, more net zero or more pre-K? Um, I can't speak to it, that. Has I it mean, all stalled? I don't know. I will, ask, I will probably have to defer to Mr. Okay. Gist on that one. Right. I don't um, know. The other comment, well, obviously, I like your recommendation. <laughs> <laughs> I had my mind made up months sure. ago when you brought us the proposal. But um, when, you, when you do the energy use index comparison mm -hmm. chart, May I suggest that you um, remove the word existing mm -hmm. and change it to former Wild okay. Lake Middle School building <laughs> at 66 KBTU. We can do that. Um, because it's not existing. It, no, it's not. No more. Thank heavens. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Not a problem. We well, actually what we did was we used our, our chart that we had from before because it still showed the principles from both the, on the mechanical side and electrical side for both right. scenarios. All right. Anybody else? Ms. Delmont Small. Yes, ma'am. Good evening. On page eleven, you state that in the second bullet that the it will accommodate 500 students, yet you just said that the population in 2030 will be over 500, the school could take 540. Mm -hmm. So, but the 500 doesn't include pre-K, and we're right. saying, that, so it's, so the actual, I'm gonna do Go ahead. body count, I don't, maybe I that's understand. It. Total student count, so our total student count is 580. We're building a school that can handle 500. Well, basically, honestly, where am I wrong? Honestly speaking, basically, if we go with our board-approved calculations per um, per grade, you have 22 children for K, you have 19 for um, grades one through two, and you have 25 for grades three through five. So, if you do the math, basically, four per room for the K students, that's 88 children. For the one for grades one and two, that's 152 children. For grades three through five, that's another 300 children. That's 540, that's 540 right there. Plus, when you add in the pre-K rooms that's already factored in, that's another four rooms at 20 per child. That gives you actually a total body count potentially of 620. Okay, then where, why am I? But it says New School Illustrated is a smaller version of the current elementary school number 42 design, which will accommodate 500 students. So you're telling me it will accommodate 500 but even before we've done anything, we're putting 620 in the building. Basically, what it is is the fact that, and when, again, this may be a miscayment question, it's all in how we count the children. Basically, what, I, what I'm saying is the fact that we only count certain grades. K through five? K through five. Okay. And with those numbers, we do have a building that's large enough based off count to take care of that. If the 500 is misleading, I apologize. Basically, it can accommodate 540 children without the pre-K. And with the pre-K added, it actually is more than that. Okay, so now we're saying that it can accommodate 540 kids without pre-K. Without the pre-K. The pre-K is extra. We can't, we can't show that in the count. But if you actually look at the number of classroom spaces, it incorporate, and you incorporate into your total design, it has a bigger capacity in terms of actual body count of students. Okay, this is in part why the community's head is going to explode. Okay. <laughs> and as a board member myself, because with all due respect, we can't have different numbers and different children or children or children or children. I understand part of the challenge with pre-K is that we do not get funding from the state. However, there's still bodies. And when I, as a, when a parent sends their child to school mm -hmm. and there are 500 and 80 children mm -hmm. in that school, that's what the parent sees, and, and that's the reality. So I, I understand it. We have to somehow change our language or our vernacular or how we are counting these children because it's very confusing because you get this, well, it is pre-K, it's not pre-K. No, 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 no. How many bodies are going to be in these schools? Because if there is a fluctuation in the number, for example, I know in mm -hmm. a non, my children went to a non-pre-K elementary school. Yeah. So if there was a fluctuation in student population mm -hmm. between kindergarten, first, so on and so forth, the school obviously had the ability to move students into a 
if we had more t more second graders than first graders, we could move into this first grade pod mm -hmm. as opposed to the second grade Understood. pod. So again, it's it's bodies whether they're this tall or this tall. Okay, ma'am, I understand so your point completely. I guess the question is, how do we figure this out? Because at some point, some parent is going to look at what I'm looking at and say, "Wait a minute! You said 500 kids. You're already putting, you know, 620 in there." Mm -hmm. One and one is two, and I understand we're not that. getting to the numbers. Well, well, two things. Number one, that's really, a, uh, that's really a question for school planning because that's not what we do in our department, number one. Right. Number two is the fact that when we build schools, understanding your concern because it affects us because the fact that we still have support spaces for cafeteria, for oh, gymnasium, totally. and things like that. So I understand your point. But in terms of how we come up with the numbers and things like that, I'll defer to school plan to answer that question because they take care of those counts and Ms. Kamen can answer that question. That's not a school construction question. Because that's my concern for you as well on the construction side is you want to make sure, we want to make sure that we as a board support the size that you know that we need, you know that we need for our cafeterias, our bathrooms, our playgrounds, so on and so forth. Hello. Ms. Kamen, hi. Ms. How are you doing? Um, okay, so your pro the school board's program capacity is defined in policy 6010. Um, it is a um, equation that we use that counts spaces K through five, um, and it is part of board approved staff staff student to teacher ratios. That's what um, Mr. Washington was talking about mm -hmm. earlier. So. Um, the population can fluctuate year to year. Um, when we evaluate school capacity, we generally do it when a school is being built, when a school has an addition, um, when a school is having reclaimed spaces, um, that's happened recently, um, when a school regional program is taken out and moved to a different school mm -hmm. because that is. So those are the times in which we um, recalculate capacity and that calculation is based on um, for the, um, for the elementary spaces, um, the the K K through five, because we do that in between those years, there can be flexibility in how a, a a school is being used. Like you just said, we don't calculate that. So theoretically, we we go in with our standard, and as the needs of the school change in between, whenever we're doing a renovation or addition or what have you, that population fl fluctuates. That's also why we have that ninety to one hundred and ten percent. Um, range that we use whenever we're determining when a school is over capacity. It's because of those minor fluctuations that can happen because you might have a larger first grade class over a second grade class and those rooms essentially are interchangeable. Mm -hmm. um, so when we talk about capacity because pre-k is regional program, um, we don't ignore the students. We just we don't for our purposes we only go with K through five. Um, there the when we design a building, those students are still counted, um, but we, again, in consistency with our policy, it's K through five. Um, so it's consistent throughout the entire cycle of whatever we're doing, when we're doing projections, when we're doing our capital improvements, when we're trying to figure out if a school, how many seats does a stu specific school need. So those calculations, even though the school is for about 540, it, um, there could be more students in there. Um, it could be a little bit higher or a little bit lower. It's just that's our standard as a school system that we decided to use in terms of our staff ratios, how big the spaces we have. Um, and so I, that was decided many, many years ago. Um, okay. So it was decided. However, that means. so you can change it. Can I'm change not going to recommend no, no, no. changing it, but I'm in the middle of something. But you can you can look at it. We had an evaluation of all our program spaces um, for a couple of years between 2014 and 2015, I believe. We looked at our elementary, <laughs> middle, and high school. It was a process. We brought it to the board of education, um, and we had an outside firm evaluate all of our spaces. Um, that's how the current um, program spaces are actually cal calculated. Um, and that's the standard by which we use in order to move forward. Um, if the board wants to change that, that's another process that we would have to do and go through a public, um, through all of it, to look at all of our spaces again and, and um, look at what kind of ratio does the, does the school board want to look at um, in terms of teacher-student. Teacher it's not, 
what actually is happening in the classroom, it's a standard, it's, it's, um, it's, a, it's um, a, little bit, a little bit different in that respect. So the okay. board can absolutely look at it and revisit it, but it would just be another process um, that we would go through. Okay, but that's a good discussion for another, another day. day. Mm -hmm. However, back to this issue, is that can we, I do not think that prevents us as a board in a school system from presenting information in a more clear manner that says, for example, Talbot Springs Elementary School, pre-K program capacity, pre-K, 80. Current capacity, 72. K through five, capacity, 500. Current capacity, you know, utilization. actual utilization, whatever that's, word. That's, that's that fine. That can be done. That can be done. Because I think that would help because, again, define our terms, be clear, because the challenge in redistricting and with many things is we're all having, we're having, we're trying to have the same conversation, but we're using different data and using different terms, and we're going around in a circle, and it's not helping anybody. I want to be able to make sure that we as a system are as clear as possible when we talk about these things, because in looking at this document, it's a little bit confusing as to how many students we have and how many we are putting where. Um, now, regarding the net zero issue, mm -hmm. you, the statement was made that whether or not an, a building is net zero is based on the building producing as much energy in a year's time as it consumes right. in a year time or be less. Mm -hmm. How can we state that Wild Lake Middle School is a success if it has not been operating for a year? Well, one of the reasons why, because of we have trend data going back to when it went online, and we can tell from the trend data right now that it is moving in that direction. So we have data. Um, I think it goes back it goes back months in the school since they've been in the it's building. February. And yeah, I'm gonna say since about February or January. They have data that as he shows is trending toward that direction. So we're based off the data we currently have, we're very positive that the school will be it will be successful by the end of the year because it's already trending that way. Because it's using less than they expected it to right. be using. Okay. Well, so it's also still a construction site. Well, that but actually that construction that construction actually remember that's more the fields right now. That's not so much the building. The building is already operational and functional. So that data is being done off of what's going on in the building. So then, my question is: Will the footprint of the property? How many acres is this again? Ten. Ten. It's ten acres. So is the foot? How does the footprint of the property? compare to the number of solar panels as to Wild Lake Middle School? Uh, we have not done that level of research yet because we haven't, we haven't decided on that option. Remember, this is feasibility. This right, is not I actually know. design. So I couldn't really tell you off the top of my head, but what I am concerned about is the fact that it is a tighter site. We did look at those items, things like that. You know, and there are things that would have to be done in terms of those panels, renewable energy, that I'm concerned about. I mean, just in terms of the actual cost. I mean, we did do a yeah. we did do a comparison cost. I think it's an extra five or five point eight million dollars, whatever it was, and um, that's based off of envelope and things like that. There were some things we can affect, and we know right off the top of our head we can take care of it. But those panels and the site and the workability of the site and being able to get around the site with construction and things like that on a smaller site is a concern. You're right. And, and yeah. again, that's another thing. I mean, I think this having net zero is a lovely sure. idea, but there's the practical piece of right. it. Because for us to complicate your job mm -hmm. is not, I know where I'm going. Believe it or not, I don't want your job to be more complicated. Right. I think, the, I think, the, honestly speaking, Ms. Delmo, so I think the biggest thing is that even though it may not be a net zero school, quote unquote, there's lessons we've learned from the design of that school and other buildings. We've already implemented some things at ES42 to be learned from Lyle Lake because we'd already done that job. So moving forward, there's things you can implement in terms of the envelope, in terms of the mechanical electrical systems and things like that, that can make that building as energy efficient as possible. Um, one thing I like to I always say about the schools we've done in the county, and this is one thing I you know I'm very really proud of, is the fact that we do have nine lead schools in the county. Mm -hmm. You know, we have nine total, we have two gold, we have seven silver. And out of those nine, six of them overachieved their design. 
They were the they were designed for one thing and came in ahead of that. So there's no reason to believe that we can't overachieve our design again or even this building here. So we can still take the principles and apply them to the building and make it an energy efficient building. And the Rex and Park space, what exactly is that? That's the usual rooms that Rec and Park has in any building. A lot, a lot of new rooms we build. It's a part of the model. Um, it's their office and classroom they have, depending on if they have a regional program and things like that in that area. And that's something we negotiate with them. Again, it's just in the feasibility right now. And if we build, we go with number three, mm -hmm. we will not need portables. No, because one of the things is that's one of the main keys. Basically, I think right now there are either 10 or 11 portables in that site. One of the main things you want to do with this building is to be able to bring all those programs inside the main building right. so that you'll be able to eliminate all those portals off the site. And that is one thing you can do with item three. That's a big, strong point for item three. Okay. And I'm going to ask this question because I am going to bet my firstborn that there is someone in the community who is at wondering this in their head, which okay. is because we're in redistricting, should we be doing, and I don't know if this, I mean, maybe this is more towards toward to my fellow board members. Does it make more sense to put this on hold and do the high, the high school first? Oh, yes. Or, I'm, or I, is that, no, people would, I'm just saying, I'm trying to anticipate. I'm sorry. I, I'd, I'd like to, I'm, I'm kind of thinking on the same wavelength, actually. Um, Mr. Washington, yes, if we were to go for the larger prototype. Okay, the 788. Is there anything in between? There's, 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 okay. there's, a, six, there's a 660, but actually, like I said, the one at, um, that's Duckett's Lane, but that's a lot bigger model for that job. That really wouldn't fit on that Is site. Is that not feasible on the property that we That's have? one of the things we looked at. That's one of the reasons why we went to this model here, because it okay. wouldn't fit. My concern <laughs> is, I mean, we've, we've had a situation where we opened an elementary school, and that was mm -hmm. almost immediately mm -hmm. Duckett's Lane, almost immediately over capacity. Mm -hmm. With the redistrict We just changed the capacity, and then it wasn't anymore. Yeah, well, we can do magic like that, but we don't want to. Um, <laughs> uh, with redistricting, mm -hmm. we really are not, we really don't know yet what the attendance will be to this school. Mm. Is it possible for us to approve of scheme three in the sense that we will affirm we are building a new school? Mm -hmm. but hold off on the size of that school until we understand what our redistricting situation will be. How, how much will that delay? Um, it, what, will this be a significant delay for the construction of the school? It can be, because basically if you take a look at your, you take a look at your design, pretty much again, usually, and Robin, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, for this three phases of our design, three months for schematics, usually four months for design development, five months for construction documents, and then basically from the time you guys approve the CD, the CD documents to the time we put shovel to the dirt, it's about six months. So if we don't start in that March or April of 19, that puts that, that number in jeopardy of the June to August of 21 because of your time frame. Um, in terms of numbers, again, I would feel more comfortable with Ms. 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 Um, Ms. Kamen answering that because she's involved in that process in terms of the numbers and things like that. But in terms of our timeline, it would shift it. It could put that August 21 opening of a new school in jeopardy because we're not making a decision now. We're pushing it off a few months. Even though you're doing a new building, it still pushes how the design starts and things like that. Well, at this point, we're we're looking at a decision about redistricting. When is it? November. Hmm. November something. Yeah, but there's no guarantee that it will be a redistricting decision that even impacts this. Well, that's the but that's the point. We but don't the point know. that the school needs to be replaced because it's falling down, not because it. Is. No, no, I am not suggesting by any I'm sorry, it's stretch not falling that down. we I are. I know, I know no, I am not suggesting that we don't build a new school. I'm suggesting that we figure out the size of that school, mm -hmm. the scope of that school, until we know what the redistricting is going to look like. But the other thing that I'm concerned about is that 
it's in the air that we may be going to toward, moving towards universal pre-K. Mm -hmm. And we need to anticipate that mm -hmm. when we build a new school. Mm -hmm. um, it may, it's not a fact right now, but sure. it could be a fact. And I'm concerned about the smaller model. Okay. Um, Even with the pre-K classrooms built into yes, the model? Yes, okay. because right now, I mean, that could grow. The number of pre-K um, kids can grow. Okay. So, My, I guess, I, guess yeah. I would like to, and I, you know, yeah. I don't know if you can, do we have to go with a model that's already in existence? So that, are we stuck with either the 540 or whatever versus the 600? We're, or can we, do we have any wiggle room? You're, you're not so much stuck as this. Remember, we have to go by the Ed Specs. You have a 2010 Ed Spec that's already a board approved, and that document basically determines the size of our buildings, the number of classrooms, things like that. You apply that to the individual sites to see what the school's needs are. Um, so there's, there's wiggle room in that, but I guess my biggest concern more than anything, again, is that opening date. It puts that yeah, opening date in jeopardy. That's my most major concern. Is it concern. possible, you know, again, I'm not no architect. Um, is it possible to go ahead with this model, mm -hmm. but with a schematic of how it might expand before it, you know, once we know all of the... Um, the factors. Yeah, yeah. We've I, actually, I was just talking about. I mean, we've done that before. I mean, you well, can show how a school is built and where it can potentially be added to or expanded to. You can do something like that. Um, that's something that we can definitely take into the, in the design process with schematics, and that may help you out with that. That, that can be, be great. That can be done. So then, that that basically is the best of all worlds. We can go with what we've got. Sure. With the no information we currently have right. on on enrollment, on, you know, mm -hmm. attendance with, but that the design incorporates right. the potential for expansion. Right, because re remember, remember, um, this is and just And then that right. first, the old building will be gone by then. And <laughs> remember, we'll this is just your room. feasibility study. So no actual design work okay. has been done. So the feasibility study is just looking at the possibilities and options you have and which one makes more sense to do. So, I mean, we have time, you know, if okay. that's the case, to do some work on that. Um, basically, if we know something, I mean, it may, it may affect our schematic date a little bit, depending on when that decision comes back. Or there may be an adjustment from schematics to design development. If I'm not mistaken, um, you may recall with, uh, with Waverly Elementary School, uh, about a year or two when we brought that, we had one model schematically. We went back and looked at a couple of things. It changed and DD slightly because of some needs that were taken into account that weren't unknown about at the first time. Okay. So there's some time to do that. All right. Um, but like That's I said, good. we just want to make sure we get those decisions promptly. Okay. Then That's I'm good. ready to vote. I don't know about everyone else. Um, <laughs> well, I think that we have a couple more people who have something they'd like to add. Or um, I have a couple questions. Yes, One is, I, can I, I assume that in your evaluation of the site, mm -hmm. what you were telling us in the beginning is that this footprint is what you believe to be the maximum buildable footprint That's, for yeah. the site. Yeah, because we, we looked at a few options. We looked at we actually looked at our Douglas Lane prototype, we looked at the mm -hmm. Holly Fuel Station prototype and things like that because of the more of the population the school mm -hmm. has or even if it's a little bit larger and they're more linear. So it mm -hmm. just it's it's too wide for that site. And that's why we had to kind of go back to the 78 model, mm -hmm. which you look at it, even though it's a bigger model, it can be box shorter. And that's what makes it more condensable. Okay, so just to forgetting about our existing models, sure. there's a certain amount of the, the lot that can be absorbed by a building. I do and that's that. basically, you, this basically maxes that out right. as far as your analysis goes. Right. At this Regardless time. of what model we end sure. up using or just say build something, design something different. No, right. So short of going to three floors, this is about the maximum size of a structure you that mean? you are anticipating being feasible for this I site. I would say yes, ma'am. Okay. Now, when it comes down to the question of capacity, it's, I think this is part of what is frustrating to, to lots of people. Sure, I see. 
forget how we're going to use it in general mm -hmm. or what our capacity, you, you know, what our, in our uh, attendance uh, projections are. Mm -hmm. We have a brand new building mm -hmm. that we're building mm -hmm. that is designed to accommodate X number of students. Understood. Can we just get a straight number on, forget this one, this one, this one, or this one. This building is designed that it can hold without changing its use or its attendance area or anything else. This is how many childlike bodies that we have designed this. Of a certain weight, height. Yeah. <laughs> that that this building, it, it's, and I'm, now you lost me at 620 because I was, I was cool with the 540. Mm -hmm. And then, but then the going back to the 500 and then adding the 80 made me, made it's, my head start to hurt. It's, so, it's, I understand. It's, it's, and, and basically, again, it's, again, how we, we work with the numbers of how they are counted. But the 620, again, no, no, no. is just. How big I, I is the building? And how many saying. classrooms and how many we, little and people? And that's how when we count, that's why I gave you the total number of 620. Because if you look at your ratios and you look at your number of classrooms, that's how many bodies can fit inside the so building. So if we, if, if we build this building the way it's sort of sketched out, right. with four preschool classrooms, yes, four, four per level. K, four whatever, a hundred million square feet. It's four per level. That we are looking at a capacity of 620 students. Forget how we slice and dice. Based on the count, okay. right. And in this building, in yes. this in this scheme, in yes. this building, 620. Okay. All 620. Right. 620 little desks okay. right. in the, because just of, in the regular. Right. And to make it any bigger, we would have to go to a third floor. Or because, try to expand the footprint somehow. Is that because you said that you think can, that the, ex no, no, can. you can't back off no, on no, that No, 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 I'm, I'm saying, I'm saying, <laughs> there, I mean, because what I'm saying is if there's <laughs> ways of putting addition or something on, we would have to examine that. Some eight yeah, I don't want to include the, they can't, there's only so much expansion you can include if, right. because there's a footprint limit. I know, but didn't you answer and wasn't your answer to me that you could create this school with, design it so that there is room for potential expansion? We always go ahead. Yes or no? So you're asking about the zoning laws and how much buildable space on this piece of property is available for the building. Not just zoning. Whatever the limitations of this site are, this well, is the multiple, maximum yeah, coverage. There, right. You've there's got your setbacks, mm -hmm. you've got, you know, different ratios and all of that. We did not evaluate what is the largest building we could put on here. Right. Um, huh. Our understanding, I mean, our understanding was what can you get on while the building is occupied? Right. And it was our understanding that there was not a need on this site for a 788 K through five um, elementary school to be placed. And it couldn't fit. Well, okay. that, but you don't. So, if you didn't evaluate whether it could fit or not, we really can't answer that question, right? The big school we did initially put on the side. elementary school 42's right. footprint would not fit, would not fit. fit yes. while the existing building right. is sitting there. Right. Yes. While but it once is the occupied, existing none building of the is existing gone. prototypes elementary schools that you have would fit while the existing building is there. Right. Mm -hmm. But so if, they, if we're going to do what we were talking about, right. what you're talking, yes. you, you can always design the building so that you can add additions that's, later. Right. Yes. But that's, the, I want to make that clear because it, we're not talking to add alternates where later on we'll decide no. in the process, we'll decide to make it bigger. Those would be actual additions that would come later, what, what they're talking yes, about. And, and include and that I think, in the design. And I think the clarification, of, I mean, make sure we're both on the same page, is again, what she just said. That's as big a building with the existing school still being there. If, you, the if it's not there, it of course there. you have more room. Yeah. But the existing school is there with those 500 or plus kids. Mm -hmm. you, you have to have a place for them while the rest of it is being done. We get, we get it. I just yeah. see here's, here's what the, the, lead, the reason for the that laying that foundation oh. no, <laughs> is that it is exponentially more expensive to build an addition than to build a slate than oh, to build the building bigger to begin with, right? Sure, I understand. So if we could build a seven hundred student building there, or we anticipate that we might need a seven hundred student building there in the next 
you know, number of years, mm -hmm. then it would be more financially feasible. And when we've made that argument before, and we successfully did that at Dayton Oaks, then we've been being beaten up with over it. For years. Because it is, they're waiting for the people when they come. Right. And it was cheaper to build it bigger now than to add on to it later. Right. So the bottom line for me, as far as what we're doing, about the process we're about to get into, is okay. we have identified this build it over here, right. keep the building operating right. as a, a desirable thing. Yes. If we choose to go forward with that, this is really the biggest building we're going to be able to put over there. Right. That's more and, what and what we'd like to make sure that we realize that what you include in the, the design later is that you shouldn't have to tear down half of it to add an addition. No. So you'll you'll make that and way then once you can occupy no. it. Right. It could be occupied down wow. the that's, line. Okay. But, that's the and in the meantime, like okay. if we could just make a as Miss Delmont Small, there's a number mm -hmm. that that building is designed to hold mm -hmm. without any other, you know, caveats. His this building is we designed can, we to can hold put a, 680 we can put a appendix in there or whatever it is. This, this is list the number out yeah. based off just bodies, not the way to count it, but just boom, yeah. boom, 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 boom. This is as it's designed right That's now. Fine. This is 620 bodies. Understood. Okay. Does everybody understand it? Because if I have mis summarized, then okay. Are we good? I see Ms. Delmont Small and Ms. French back on the lit list. Very quickly. Um, we're go you're, you're utilizing 2010 ed specs? Yeah. Are they providing you the flexibility that you need? So far, we haven't had any complaints from any of the schools that we've built about problems with the specs, but I know that pretty much, again, they'll probably need to be updated in the not too distant future as well, just because if you take a look, the last ed specs elementary-wise were updated in 2003 before right. 2010, so 10, 17, so moving Well, forward, no, and that's we'll kind of where I was going, right, because the sure. last thing I, I think the board wants to do is tie your hands unrealistically. Sure. Again, sure. how can we help that process? And one of the things also, remember, Ms. Delmont Small, is even though we have our ed specs, we still have to meet with everybody in the curriculum. And a lot of times what happens with those meetings is we have to project where the programs are moving forward to right. as best as we can. And we try to accommodate that into design. So it's not just the, the black and white there. It's where do the leaders see their programs going and can we implement that into the design of the school. So it's functional because, right, once again, right now, this is 2017. Right. By the time it's done, it'll be 2021. Right. You want to make sure the things in place, they still need to move forward. Great. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Ms. French, did you have any things still I like I move that the board approve <laughs> scheme three for Talbot Springs Elementary School without net zero funding. Okay. I second. Any Wait, additional discussion or argument? All right. Ready? Yes, ma'am. We have a motion by Mrs. French and a second by Ms. Coombs. Mr. Hedgeboo? Yes. Ms. Coombs? Yes. Dr. Altwerger? Yes. Ms. Valancourt? Yes. Ms. Delmont Small? Yes. Mrs. French? Yes. Motion passes 6 0. Thank you. And thank you for uh, that's actually some, some very old pent up energy that just got that's not a problem. settled, I think. We understand. <laughs> yeah, just getting the there's a number. Yeah. yeah just. Okay, my house has four bedrooms, and if I put six kids in them, then that doesn't make it a six-bedroom house. 